Hello, it's Andy back at doing the November 2023 production update. Today's October 27th, and uh, we have a lot of stuff in store for this month. Actually, we had a lot of stuff in store in this month, and I will share it with everybody like we did for the previous month. Let's talk about production. So long mill production has been going pretty well. We have about 1,100 machines available. We put out the beginner's kit about two months ago, and that's been pretty popular. If you guys don't know, the beginner's kit is basically the kit that you get if you're not sure what you need to get for the start, for getting your machine started. And we've been pre-packing a whole bunch of them. So if you want to place an order for a beginner's kit, they'll ship out within a day essentially. Yeah, beginner's kit's going well. Uh, we have regular machines that we pack the old-fashioned way. Um, usually they'll ship within a couple of days as well. We are at the last part of the Vortex rotary axis batch. So we started with producing the first 300 units and we're almost, I think we have about 30 units left now. If you're thinking of getting one, it's a good time before we run out. We are currently working on a new batch we should have the parts coming in about a month to a month and a half, I would say. So there may be a bit of a lag time where we're out of stock and we're waiting on new stuff. You know, if you're on the fence about it, make sure to get one before the batch ends or, you know, we'll have some more available probably around December. Laser Beam is also shipping pretty consistently. Uh, should be a couple days for most of the units. So no specific news on that. We are working on a new batch um, we're ordering a new batch of components in so that we can do production on the, the batch after that. Ikena is actually at the Lightburn conference, the software that we use for the laser beam. And he's going to be talking with a lot of people that work on the software to see what they're working on, what sort of features are coming down the line, and providing feedback on how we can make your experience better with the light burn and the laser beam. We're also starting to work on the CO2 laser project, which is basically, um, well, it's, it's a CO2 laser. So a lot of customers who have the light, uh, the laser beam, they've told us, hey, we really like the laser beam, but we need more power. Diode lasers, they're, uh, they have a limit to how powerful they can be. So with the CO2 laser, we can get like 10, 15, 20 times more power. And you can cut, the idea is you'll be able to cut through a bunch of stuff. We have a philosophy in terms of building our machines, especially for the hobbyist market, to make them affordable, easy to use, and always having really good customer support and the resources to make sure everyone's successful. So I think focusing on those core values and putting that into a CO2 laser, which is what Ikena is super passionate about, is going to make something that's going to be, that's going to make this technology more accessible for people. I'm pretty excited for that. Uh, we're working on a survey to kind of get some feedback on what sort of things people might be looking for. Keep an eye out for that. We have a lot of updates for things that we're developing. Um, we'll start off with the super longboard. So if you guys don't know, we're working on a new controller system for the long mill. Um, there's a couple of issues that have been cropping up since we developed the first one. One being um, disconnects. There's a lot of different reasons for disconnects. Sometimes it's a hardware thing, sometimes it's a computer thing, and sometimes it's a mixture of both. What we did with the, what one of the main and the most important part of this new board design is that it's isolating it from the noise, and it also has components and parts that will help eliminate disconnecting issues. The second is to tr get more performance out of the, the machine. And so with the drivers that we're using on this new board, they're more efficient, they're more cap they work more quietly, and they can work in a larger range of speeds. So the performance on the new board will be better. And it'll come with a lot of different features. For example, more inputs and outputs. So if you wanted to have a command to activate something there will be like you can trigger relays we have more options for controlling spindles such as rs485 as well as a, the pwm output that's the same as the uh, current longboard we have a separate pwm output for the laser so you can have two separate pwm outputs for laser and 
a spindle or you can control other things with PWM as well. We also have a couple of new safety features. So one of them is the e-stop is controls the board as well, which means that when you turn the e-stop off, it'll kill the power to the machine, but also anything that's connected to it, it can send a signal to disable stuff. If you have a, a, a laser beam, for example, um, it will cut like the power to the laser beam. We also are working on the CNC router, which I think I talked about a little bit in the past update, but the idea will be that you'll connect the, the, the CNC router to the controller, and because the controller is controlling the speed, and the on-off state of the router, um, it'll also be able to shut that off simultaneously. The board will also be able to save its own state. So if you need to turn it off and turn it back on again, it'll be able to save that information. So it'll be easier to restart your job um, if you hit the e-stop. There's a couple other things that we're working on that is still in development. Uh, for example, the stall detection. The idea is that if your machine stalls, we'll be able to know if that happened and use that to warn the user or turn things off. Um, that will be a pretty big challenge. Um, so not sure how that will happen and if that will be a feature that will be available right away. Uh, we also have general motor tuning to get as much performance out as possible, as well as testing the inputs and outputs for different applications. So the other thing that this board will have is independent fourth axis, which means that if you have a Rotex, um, right now you have to switch between the turning on the Y axis and the A axis. So you have to turn off, turn on the, uh, you have to set it to rotary mode and then like rotate the axis or you have to um, switch it to Y axis mode so you can do the linear movements. With this board, uh, because it has its own completely separate output, you can run all of them simultaneously. So you can do f true four axis milling, which isn't like in practicality, like because of the software, um, might be a little bit impractical, but there it does open up a lot of new avenues um, in terms of what you can do with this controller. There are a couple things that we're also working on. So um, we made some mistakes on the circuit design of the board. And so we've reworked some of them by hand, which we can for the sake of testing. We're shipping a couple to, uh, to, the, to Expatria, which we're working with to do some more rework to so sort of solve those issues, make sure they work, and then start uh, production on a new batch. Just, yeah, general stability uh, updates, also making sure G-Sender is able to utilize and have the interface for all the features, and continuing to work with the beta tester to make sure that the board is super reliable. So Chris will do an, uh, a fuller update. He's like the lead for the project. Watch out for that. Um, otherwise, the project is moving along. There's been a lot of hurdles, but I'm pretty excited for what it's been able to do so far. And I think it's going to be a really big implementation, like it'll be a really big deal for the CNC um, space in general, based because of how advanced it is and how affordable it's going to be. And um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, other updates, I've been working on making the new spring-loaded anti-backlash nuts. John and I have been working a little bit on different designs, one of them being like a flexure. What we found was that if we can injection mold the nuts from with Delrin, they're a lot, lot cheaper. So what I'm hoping for is that we can make the nuts for basically like similar price as the current version, but obviously like with the spring-loaded and all the advantages of not having to adjust the uh, nuts and more consistent performance, um, you know, it'll be, an upgrade we can provide without, you know, being expensive. We've made like one major change, which is to put the spring going in this way and also the arm design so that it's more linear pushing towards the thread. So I've sent off the designs to our manufacturer and we, I just got back the quotes today. So I'll be looking at that and then we'll do the validation on the designs before we start production on them. A lot of people have been asking for the T12 size, which is this design. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get that out in the next couple of weeks. Um, other updates, we've been working on the CNC router. So if you guys aren't familiar, what we wanna do is uh, design 
sort of a replacement for the Makita router, but implement a lot of features that you'll find on spindles. So for example, like a quieter design, uh, better bearings and more accuracy, as well as like the speed control, the active speed control. Um, so you can control like turning on and off the spindle with the controller. Um, we made some progress on the mechanical design of it. So the spindle, the collet, and the uh, bearings design, as well as like the shell and the body. However, we're still struggling to find a good source for the motors themselves. So um, me and Johan are, are working on that. I think we have some good options now, and I have a couple ideas on how to kind of get this project started. I believe what is kind of tricky is that we're trying to build like a thousand, a couple thousand, maybe like even up to 5,000 of these uh, routers. But a lot of the manufacturers, they are making like tens of thousands of these components. So when it comes to manufacturing at this scale, there's a little bit of like juggling that we need to do in terms of like trying to find someone that's willing to work with us in producing these smaller quantities, as well as um, wanting to customize some of these things, but also recognizing we may have to use some off-the-shelf components because of the availability and our ability to engineer these parts. So that's an interesting challenge. But you know, this isn't our first rodeo, so we'll keep working on that. I think in the last update, I mentioned like the Makita router design isn't great for CNCing partially because the internal component, a lot of the internal components are made of plastic. So they're designed for like a little bit of flexibility. And, um, you know, because it's like a commodity, like a, a high volume item and there's an assembly involved, it allows for some like misalignment and stuff. But in a CNC situation, that misalignment also translates to like parts that aren't as good. So the Makita is like a pretty good option, but it is, wasn't ever designed for CNCing. So with that in mind, you know, with the long, the, the, the CNC router will address some of those issues. The other thing is with the speed control, um, it'll be compatible with uh, most hobbyist control boards. So you'll be able to turn it on, like speed control the router. And because we're using a different method to control the speed, um, even though we're using the same power and the same components, we should see a little bit of a bump in terms of power and efficiency as well. There, we do have to work on getting the noise down. Um, it should be slightly less noisy. Uh, a lot of it will come down to the mechanical design and the airflow design. Um, so I think with a combination of better bearings, more efficient router, and a better airflow, it'll be a lot quieter. But I won't be able to confirm that until we actually like put together our prototypes and do our testing. Based on the testing results so far, um, it seems like there's a lot of areas that the noise comes from. For example, the brushes and the friction from that is a source. Initially, we thought the fan was gonna play a bigger role into the noise, and it does like add quite a bit of noise, but not as it's not like 80% of the noise, it's maybe like 20%, 30%, I think. Because there's a lot of different areas the noise comes from, we have to like kind of narrow down specifically what that's gonna be. Um, but you know, engineering, we can, we can figure this out. We are also exploring other drive technologies. So for example, uh, three-phase is always an option for like spindles. Uh, it's got its pros and cons, uh, as well as brushless DC motors. Like the biggest pro being it's a powerful, option that has like lots of range for speed and it's a very compact design but because it runs off DC we need a DC power inverter which uh, it's hard to find that's like a thousand watts at least like one that's inexpensive and doesn't look like we can engineer and to be like reliable if that makes sense because we want to make it a replacement for the Makita. We also want to focus on the price point. With the other technologies, they're a lot more expensive. And uh, although some people are willing to pay for that, um, there are also like BFDs. Based on our survey, there's maybe like five to ten percent who use spindles with the long mill, uh, which isn't like a small number, but it's not a big number either. So it's my 
I guess, point of view is like, oh, like there are spindle options now, but if people aren't using them where the, in the state that they are now, are people willing to like get them? Like if we made a spindle package as well, is that something people are going to be wa wanting? There are like um, off the shelf spindle options now that are compatible with the long mill. You can just buy from somewhere. We're figuring this out. We're, we're going to figure it out. Oh, hey, Alfie. The alt mill project. So if you guys don't know, we were working on a project that used linear guides and ball screws and was going to be a four foot by four foot machine. So basically like on, on the next step up from the long mill. Kind of sidelined that project for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we weren't sure if it was going to be like a good viable project. Um, and if it was, we wanted to like focus on that versus like other things that we were working on. Secondarily, it was going to take up a lot of space. And because our office here is like very packed right now, uh, it was hard to manage. And I think also like we didn't have a lot of experience with the manufacturing side at that point. And like there wasn't a clear direction on how we wanted to pursue that project. Now looking at where we are now, um, there's a couple differences, different situations. One is we're moving to a new building. I, and I don't remember if I update everyone, but we are moving to the new building. And a lot of this moving will happen next week. We'll have like double the space essentially. So we'll have space to design and build prototypes for the, uh, the alt mill. We also have a lot more manufacturing experience. And so there's a lot of, I guess, challenges in terms of building this larger machine. One is like the precision and accuracy over like a larger space. How much like dealing with bigger motors, more powerful motors, and dealing with more pre precision components that need to be like aligned with each other better. Because we've up, like made the long mill QA much more intense and much better, a lot of those things that we learned from that process, we can implement into making sure that the alt mill is a super high quality product that's going to work. And also our experience with working with aluminum extrusion and making custom extrusions and also making custom parts for the long mill in general, those we can all implement as well. So like for the 48, the 48 by 30 version of the long mill, like a lot of stuff that we learned, let's say for example, like lead screw whip, and managing like the cable and all this sort of stuff. Those are like a precursor to developing a larger machine than that. The next thing is when we did the survey for the alt mill a year ago, we had like around 300 people who were like, yeah, this is really great. Like I'm super interested in this. Probably about half of those people are like, yeah, I, I'll be down to buy an alt mill. What I realized is that at this point now, we probably have even more people interested in product like that. But also, we've kind of like solved all the non-trivial engineering question marks of like, can we make this at an affordable price? What sort of components do we need to use for it? What sort of market do we have? What sort of customers are we looking for? And is there a good use case for this sort of product? Product. And the takeaway was, even if we built like 50 machines, 100 machines, like a small number, because like we can make it at a like a, a reasonable margin and we have the experience and the people who can build it we might as well just start and build the machines in the quantities that we can afford at this stage and then kind of scale up from there one of the directions that i've been considering is what if we just build alt mills like one at a time in a small batch just sell them to people who are looking for them um, because our primary business here is like trying to build a ton of machines and make the price really low by like economies of scale. But we can utilize the economies of scale that we already have with long mill production, but use it for a new pro product. And so we can validate whether or not it, it's a product that makes sense. And because we already have a customer base from the survey and because we have a network and some like, uh, I guess, clout, as they say, I feel like it can be a viable project, even if it's not a big scale project at this stage. That's been percolating through my mind. We'll figure things out as we go, but we just got quotes for a lot of the components that we want for the alt mill, and they're very, very affordable. Uh, working with the manufacturers that we've been working with for the last 
maybe four or five years. We will continue to share more information about that. And uh, yeah, let me see if there's any other things to share about development. Oh, OK. So no updates for development, I think. Obviously, read the blog. Like, I'll keep writing stuff in the blog. Me and Leandro, Leandro is our marketing manager. Uh, we just came back from Brazil this past week. So a little bit of background. The Canadian government has trade commissioners. And the trade commissioner's job is to facilitate trade between uh, Canada and other countries. And so we got an email maybe like three months ago from a trade commissioner saying like, oh, hey, we have this trade mission coming for Brazil. We're looking for people in advanced manufacturing to participate. And I was like, hmm, cool. Trip to Brazil and also manufacturing? OK. I don't know if you guys know this, but we have five Brazilian employees at CNC Labs. And over like spending time with them, I've learned a lot about the Brazilian culture and um, heard a lot of stories about the country. And you know, everybody from Brazil came here for, I guess, a hope for a better future. Like part of the reason I wanted to go is to kind of connect with that better, to understand like what is the place that some of the team members that we have here came from. And uh, also, it's Brazil. Like, I've heard so many amazing things about the country. And um, you know, the food, the culture, the people, the music, um, the beaches. I was like, OK, cool. So uh, you know, we talked with the trade commissioner. We applied. And we didn't really have any specific goals or like things that we want to get out of the trip specifically in mind. But we applied anyway, and they were like, yeah, you can go. I was like, OK, cool. A couple of people approached me and said, hey, you know, if you're going to go on the trip, you know, I'll be interested as well. Um, Leandro also was like, oh, I'm interested as well. And um, Leandro's done business in Brazil in the past and obviously speaks Portuguese. And so I figured, OK, this is like probably the best person to take along with the trip. So yeah, we went to uh, Brazil together. So the main part of the trade mission was in Porto Alegre and Caixa do Sul uh, in the province of Rio Grande, right? Rio Grande do Sul. And so a little bit of background about that region. It's on the southern part of Brazil. And just for like, so everyone knows, Brazil is like a massive, massive country. It's like one of the largest in the world. And um, so they have, like, people know about some of the major cities like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, but um, they have pockets of manufacturing all across the country. And Caixa do Sul is one of the uh, largest and most well-known manufacturing hubs in Brazil. During that time, we got to go see a lot of factories, engineering institutions, like trade schools and um, trade centers, and also meet people in the manufacturing industry as well as like the government like collab like the trade commissioners and like the people in Brazil that are working together to kind of bring manufacturing back and forth. And we also went to Mercopar, which is the largest manufacturing trade show in Latin America. And it was like a big, big trade show with tons and tons of stuff. They connected with the trade commissioners, connected us with different businesses in Brazil. Uh, they started some conversations with us to potentially bring some technology that we've developed for hobbyist CNCing to be applied towards like uh, small scale manufacturing. Brazil is a very well developed country in a lot of ways. They have tons of technology. They develop a lot of, they manufacture a lot of things. And um, like even just for context, Randon, which is one of the manufacturers that we went to see, um, they told us that 60% of buses in North America use their brake components, either their brake pads or like their calipers and other components that they build for buses. Tram and China, another company that makes uh, kitchenware, they make like something like 20,000 frying pans per day and they ship like to 120 countries. So if you go to Canadian Tire, you can buy Tram and China uh, frying pans and cutlery and stuff. It also kind of opened my eyes to like what sort of things m might CNC Labs want to consider in the future, and like what 
are things that we are going to face as we grow as a company, as we grow as a team, what I saw there and how that applies to here. What are some of the similarities and what are some of the differences? Here's kind of like the breakdown. The importance of their ethics, their morals, the sustainability and the way that they treat their employees was always a really important part for every company. Um, I think the reason for that is because you need, like, you need people to want to work for the company. I saw there's a lot of different ways that they did that. One is through having infrastructure for the employees. So for example, having facilities for education, um, hospitals, places to eat, like in the factory region itself. Um, Tram and China, for example, they have like, it's basically like a small city where they have like everything. It's not just that they are the company and everyone's focused on that. They also create more economic wealth because they, they bring in all these people and they need manufacturing, sup, uh, food, services to support all the employees as well. So they play a major economic role in the whole system. For me, uh, as someone who runs this company, treating the employees well is also very important to me. Now that we're at like 30 something people, it's not like a big, big company, but it, it, it feels big to me. And so a lot of these people I see every day and I feel there's a sense of responsibility for them. At some point, like, I'm not gonna be interacting with everybody. And so to make sure the, my, I guess, philosophy on how we should treat each other continues to be shared like, with everybody and all the management and everybody's involved regardless of whether I'm there or not to sort of be, uh, how do I say, set an example essentially. So that was one important thing. The second thing is um, scale helps be competitive. And what I mean by that is when you have to make like hundreds of thousands of components every day, every month, you have to, if you want to be competitive, you just have to find the most efficient way to produce that many components. Because the CNC industry is still like, hobby CNC industry is still very developing. Even though we're a small company, we're still like a pretty major player. And we only make like a few thousand machines per year. But if another competitor wanted to like make that volume of machines, I know that there's, they need to kind of like reach our uh, efficiency level to be able to do that as well. Yeah, me and Chris have these conversations sometimes of like what sort of scale do we want our business to look like and how is that going to impact the viability, the sustainability and the enjoyment of being here and working here as well. Just seeing like how big the companies are also like shows and also talking about how their business has changed over time like either being like changes in sales volume some companies, uh, like Marco Polo, for example, during the co during COVID, they like got so many more orders than before. They they scaled up like double during that time, more than double during that time. Randon was like, oh, we had to cut back like 25% of production because um, sales have dropped recently. And so, kind of under like I asked them about their strategies and how they mitigate these ups and downs, and it's been interesting to hear like. Some of the problems are similar to like a small company scale. Some of them are different. Opens up like what sort of challenges may come down the line if the company grows bigger. The other thing that I learned was in terms of manufacturing, the process is like the same. You know, you have, you have to worry about um, production volume, quality control. There's lo lots of different steps and Although the, the process gets more complicated, the larger, the, the more complicated the product becomes, you can like take that same process and apply it to anything. So in our case, like we're building uh, CNC machines, like we have our subcomponents that we do our assembly for, and we need to work with like different manufacturers to get components, and then we have to put together everything. It's the same with like any large company as well. Um, it may be larger and more complicated, but things kind of scale linearly at a certain point. I guess like the good thing is, the good takeaway is like, even if the company scales, um, I know that there's a lot of things that won't have to change. There isn't like some secret sauce essentially to be able to manage 
at a larger scale, essentially. Otherwise, I had a really good time. I got to meet a lot of other Canadian uh, manufacturing people involved in the manufacturing industry. So getting to talk to them, understanding their lifestyle, understanding their business, understanding their projects and the products they sell, and talking about their challenges and successes, that was really amazing too. And uh, yeah, yesterday, uh, Leander and I had a meeting with a manufacturer in Brazil to talk about electrode, graphite electrode manufacturing, because their idea was, oh, what if we like had a small CNC machine to make the graphite electrodes rather than having to outsource them? Could be a way to save time and money. Although we, ha we, ha we started that conversation off of like, what can we do with a small CNC machine? The real conversation was, what sort of challenges do, we ha do you have in the business? Um, like for example, having access to a, a good workforce, um, managing high operational costs, and so on and so forth that are like bigger picture problems that perhaps where we are now, we don't have all the solutions for, but are definitely considerations to make when we develop and, and sell our products. And then yeah, the other thing was we ate so much barbecue, Brazilian barbecue, it was like insane. Like I had never experienced meat sweats in my life until that point. It was so delicious, but uh, yeah, it was, it was just so much. Every night was like barbecue and meat and, and, and everything. So good trip, amazing trip. Last update is, uh, oh, I forgot to mention. Uh, Leandro got me these uh, Havanas, is it Havianas? Hava Havaianas. Havaianas uh, sandals, which are manufactured in Brazil and very, very popular. So apparently my outfit today, jeans, t-shirt, and uh, Havaianas is a very classic outfit in, in Brazil. So um, I'm not going to keep wearing these because safety. I have to switch back to my regular shoes. But for the sake of this um, update, enjoy these uh, nice feet sandals. Uh, and then the last update. Uh, Chris was on vacation the past month. He went to Japan with his girlfriend and now they are engaged and uh, congratulations to them. Me and Chris have known each other for almost 10 years now. We started the company a year after we met and we were classmates at the time. And I actually remember um, when we were in student residence my girlfriend at the time was like, oh, I think, I think um, the girl that always comes to visit, she has a crush on Kelly. And I was like, you know what? I think that's true. I will say uh, Chris did also propose to me like on a snowbank um, when we were, we we're students. And now I'm like a little jealous. So, you know, I guess sometimes I got to let things go. But anyways. Uh, that was our update for this past month. November is also going to be really busy. We have the moving to do. We have all these projects in progress. Stay tuned to the updates as they come. And uh, I'll be posting on the blog. Make sure to read that. And uh, oh, I forgot. We also have the roughing bits. We made uh, some roughing end mills that are for guitar blanks. They're one and three quarter inch. Uh, flute length, they're like three and a half inch length, so you can cut a full guitar blank from one direction and they're like specialty. And we're going to test them first, but then they'll be available for sale, so make sure to check that out when that happens. Hopefully, I didn't miss anything, but check the blog. Thank you, and uh, until next time.